Hi there, everyone. I see that quite a few of you, possibly all of you, have come back, which is fantastic. <laughs> OK, let's get on straight away with the second session. OK, if you remember, last week um, we considered these four things. So we asked whether rules are essential to moral reasoning. And if you remember, we did that by looking at a moral dilemma. And we looked at two moral theories. Can you remember what they were called? Uh, I actually, we looked at many more moral theories, but vis-a-vis -vis moral rules in particular, it's, it's those two moral theories that I'm thinking of. Particularism and generalism. Well done. Good. So the particularists believe... Good. That, that there are no unbreakable rules, that, that you've got to look at each particular situation. Good. And the generalist believes the opposite, that there are moral rules. Good. OK, and then we looked at whether moral beliefs are true or false. And if you remember, we didn't look at the idea that they weren't true or false, that they're neither true or false, which is moral scepticism. But I gave you all a reference to follow that up if you were interested. But we did look at the fact that um, moral rules are made true or false by something rather different to statements like the earth is round or the cat is tabby. Do you remember? Um, and we looked at whether moral beliefs are true or false absolutely or only in relation to something. And we looked at three different types of moral absolutism. Can you remember what they were? Three different types of moral absolutism. Oh, she's good, isn't she? <laughs> absolutely, you're right. Higher order absolutism, lower order absolutism, and token absolutism. That's right. Higher order absolutism. Can anyone give me an example of, of a higher order rule that some might think would be a moral absolute? You're doing very well, so don't worry if you can't. But can you, can you think? Go on. Good, that's right, that we should promote the greatest happiness of the greatest number rather than the greatest good. But yes, you're absolutely right. Um, can anyone give me an example of a lower order moral rule that some people might believe is always and everywhere true for everyone? Sort of drinking gin and tonic at three in the afternoon or something. something we should always drink gin and tonic at three in the afternoon. I, I think you should have said two, actually. But <laughs> yes, OK, fine. And what's a token absolutist? Uh, no, that's a that, <laughs> good try, <laughs> but not quite. What, what does the token absolutist believe? This, this is actually quite a sophisticated one, so don't worry if you can't remember this one. Uh, a lie, you, in certain circumstances, you must not tell that lie, even if you believe you should not tell lies. Uh, but in some circumstances, yes, it would be OK to tell that lie. Ah, you're so close, but not quite there. Very, very close. It the would idea be wrong to tell that lie. That's right, absolutely, exactly. Much less complicated than your first answer. The idea is that uh, moral, the only moral absolutes are token moral statements. So telling that lie would be right when the Nazis are at the door saying, are there any Jews here? You look at that situation, you see, yes, in this situation, telling that lie would be the right thing to do. And what's more, if, if that's true, it's true absolutely. OK, well done. Very good. OK, so um, and we wondered, we looked at four different theories um, about what moral facts might be. If you remember that I won't ask you to remember those because we looked at them very briefly and we're going to be looking at them in some depth uh, in the weeks to follow. So good. Well done. That's um, well remembered for last week. Let's look at what we're going to look at today. OK, we're going to do all these things. I'll let you read those, because you can read as well as I can. OK, so let's move on and start doing it. OK, for a person to be legally and or morally responsible for his behaviour, he's got to satisfy two conditions. The first one is that the behaviour has got to be freely chosen. And the second one is that he's got to know the difference between right and wrong. OK, and we're going to start today by looking at each of these conditions in that order. So let's start with looking at the, the condition that you've got to be acting freely before you're, uh, you can be morally or even legally responsible for your behaviour. 
OK, we usually think of ourselves as having freely chosen our behavior when the behavior was intentional. Now, the, the idea of an intentional behavior is actually a bit of a complicated one, but you expected that, didn't you? OK, so what is it to act intentionally? OK, we act intentionally when we want something, we have a desire of some kind, and we believe that we're going to achieve whatever that thing is by performing this particular action. So thinking now about the various things I could do right at this minute, I could leap off the stage and go and shake Erica's hand, or I could leap, up, leap off the stage and go to the back and run, out, run away or something like that. Um, why would I do that action? Why would I perform that action intentionally? Well, there's got to be something I want, a desire of mine, to escape you all, perhaps. You're all asking me too many questions. I'm off. Um, and I believe that by running away, I'm going to achieve that end. I'm going to escape you all. OK. Um, so there are two, two elements to an intentional action, a desire and a belief. And the belief is about the behavior, namely that performing that behavior will achieve that end. OK. No, none of this should be new to you because you actually, in understanding the word intention, you understand all that. But, but you don't usually see it laid out explicitly in the way I'm laying it out. OK, so we perform an action intending to achieve an end, something that we desire. So one who trips over a carpet isn't acting intentionally. OK, something has happened to him. But one who pretends to trip over a carpet is acting intentionally. Because pretense, if you think of the concept of, of pretense, you can't pretend to do something except intentionally, can you? There must be a reason why you're pre pretending to do it. There must be something you want and something that uh, you believe you will get by pretending to do whatever it is that you pretend to do. Um, so, um, actually, let me just ask, I mean, can you think of any intentions with which somebody might trip over a carpet? They wanted to show that the carpet's unsafe. Yes, OK, they might have complained about it before, but nobody's acted, so they're, they're trying to show that it's unsafe. Yep. They might be trying to make people laugh. Yep, absolutely. They might, they might have wanted, decided they wanted to sue somebody. Yes, absolutely. OK, good. So um, imagine that Tom, in reaching for his pen, knocks over his mum's mug. So I reach out for my pen and knock over this glass, something similar. Um, I would defend myself by saying I didn't do it intentionally. And so is Tom going to say that? But that makes it sound as if there are actions, things that we choose to do, that are not intentional somehow. And this is a complication um, that we solve in this way. OK, his action was intentional, but only under a certain description. Under the description, he was trying to get the pen. OK, that's what he was doing, wasn't he? He was trying to get the pen. He wanted to get the pen. And he believed that by reaching out in that way, he would get the pen. Um, the very action that was the reaching out to get the pen was also the action that caused the spilling of mum's coffee the knocking over of mum's mug. But it wasn't intentional under that description. Do you see the difference? So any action, any token action, um, so if you, if you just take this as a token action, it's going to be describable in all sorts of different ways. So each one of these lines that I've drawn here could have a description attached to it. So this is Marianne writing on a flip chart. It's an action of Marianne's. It's at... 10 minutes past two. Do you see what I mean? Each different description is a description of one and the same action. And it need only be intentional under one of those descriptions for it to be an intentional action. And therefore, for me to be responsible for it, so having it's, chosen it's an to error do it. In belief. Sorry, he what's an error in belief? Well, he, he believed that by reaching out, he would pick up the pen. Well, and he believed that that was a reasonable thing to do. He didn't believe that it was going to have other consequences. Well, let, let's, let me just see if I answer the question in the next one. So um, we might hold Tom responsible for carelessness. Yes, 
If, for example, it should have been obvious to him yeah. that in reaching out like that, he would have knocked over his mum's mug. So he'd say, I didn't mean to do that. And his mum would say, oh, for goodness sake, you know, you, you, must, you must have seen that you were going to do that. So he's responsible for, for carelessness, but he still didn't intentionally knock over his... So it was an intentional action of his that resulted in the mugs being knocked over. So it was intentional. He had an intention in reaching out. It, because it was his intentional action, he is responsible for knocking over the mug, but he may have knocked it over intentionally. And then the question is, was he careless or not? Could he have foreseen if he, if he had thought about his action? So, um, OK, he didn't act with the intention of achieving that end. Um, so actions are intentional only under or only relative to, to use the vocabulary we were using last week, certain descriptions. And we're morally and legally responsible for the action only under the description in which we acted intentionally. So someone's guilty of manslaughter if an intentional action of theirs caused the death of someone, but they didn't intend the action to have that consequence. Do you see how in law you've got to have intended someone's death in order to be um, guilty of murder? If you didn't intend their death, you can be guilty only of manslaughter or various other things like cult negligence. Unconscious desire doesn't come into it. An unconscious desire it has to be a conscious thing. Well, no, um, because a lot of the things that we do are unconscious. Um, so, so, for example, uh, I often don't realise when I'm lifting up this glass to have a drink. But, uh, so there is a, an unconscious desire to, to have, a, have a drink and an unconscious intention. But of course, actually, nevertheless, the intention was there. This is something I do so often and so regularly that I don't need to be conscious of it in order to do it. But if you said to me, why are you picking up the glass? I would be able to answer that question. Um, so it, it may be below the level of consciousness, but it, it can be brought to consciousness fairly easily. We, we usually know why we act. Not always, actually, which is interesting. Uh, one, uh, sorry, there are lots of questions now. I'm going to take one and then go on, because otherwise I'm... Uh, would it make a difference if you argued that you were genetically programmed towards something like you were genetically programmed towards violence? How would that influence your intention of Okay. What so, so if I had the MAO1 gene, I think it is, I'm not sure, which um, seems to correlate with extreme violence, could I use that in a court of law to say, yes, I did it, but I didn't do it intentionally? Yes. That, that would be the argument there. Um, you say, could you ask that? Well, of course, that's a very big question, isn't it? Because... Um, we would usually say that somebody who, who can be clinically shown to be um, a kleptomaniac shouldn't be done for stealing. Um, well, if somebody has this gene and it does correlate, I suppose lots of questions would be asked about how well it correlated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, but yes, your, your question shows that you've understood what's going on here. Um, it's intentional only if you are acting on the intention to achieve some end, some desire of yours. OK, so there are behaviours that are not intentional under any description, such as tripping over a carpet, and there are actions that are intentional under some description, pretending to trip over the carpet, and only the latter are believed by us to be freely chosen. OK? Um, so of the behaviours that are intentional under some description, they're all going to be describable, yes, in many different ways. Actually, that's the point I made earlier. So here's a token action. Here are lots of dis different descriptions of this action. It's intentional under this description, let's say, but, but not under any of the others. Um, so that's the, the act, that's the description under which it was intentional. OK, but... Some people deny that even our freely even our intentional actions are freely chosen. Okay, some people believe that all our behaviours are causally determined by the laws of nature, the situation in which we find ourselves, and our upbringing. So, um, I, I think probably most people in this room remember the early 70s. If, if, if you don't, I apologise. <laughs> but um, in the early 70s, it became very fashionable to say that everything was conditioned, didn't it? 
that, that w when you did things, you did it not because you chose them, chose them freely, but because you had been conditioned to do them. Well, what they were talking about there was our upbringing. Um, your mention of genetic determinism, the idea that somebody with a specific gene might be um, given to extreme violence, not because he intended to cause any damage, but simply because he was genetically programmed, I think it was the word you used, to cause that damage. Um, and of course, actually, it's always, there's always going to be a trigger. So the laws of nature are such and such. So it says that anyone with this gene is going to engage in extreme violence. Well, that doesn't mean he's going to engage in extreme violence all the time. It means probably that he's easily triggered. So whereas something that somebody else would shrug off, he goes ballistic, um, punches somebody and so on and so forth. So a combination of his um, genetic nature, if you like, the situation in which he's found himself, and in this case, I'm not sure his upbringing would necessarily have anything to do with it, but, but can you see a combination of these things? If all these things determine us to do things, the question is, are we free to make any choices at all? Do we ever really choose to act at all? Now, anyone who believes that we don't choose to act, or, or I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Anyone who, who believes that we are causally determined, that all our behavior is causally determined, is called a determinist. And they come in two varieties. There are the hard ones and the soft ones. So hard determinists believe that all our behaviors are causally determined, okay? That, that n none of them is free, nothing we ever do do we freely choose to do? And the idea that we have free will to a hard determinist is simply an illusion. So free will and determinism are incompatible, logically incompatible, think the determinists. Um, and therefore, as each one of our behaviors is causally determined, none of them is free. No nothing we do is freely chosen by us. That's, that's a hard determinist. Um, but a softer determinist believes that even if all our behaviors are causally determined, it's still the case that they can be freely chosen. So whereas the hard determinist thinks that determinism is inconsistent with free will, the soft determinist believes that determinism is consistent with free will. So some of our behaviors are both causally determined and freely chosen by us. So for example, a philosopher called Donald Davidson would say that the things that cause us to act are our own beliefs and our own desires. Uh, and if that's what causes us to act, then you know, surely we've got as much free will as we could possibly want, he says. That's a compatibilist. And they're called compatibilists as well as soft determinists for the rather obvious reason that they believe free will and determinism are compatible. OK, libertarians, on the other hand, believe some of our actions are freely chosen and that these actions are not causally determined. OK, so they go along with the hard determinist in thinking that free will and causal determinism are incompatible. Um, but they believe that, that it's not the case that all our behaviors are determined. Are you with me? So just to summarize that, nobody believes that all our behaviors are freely chosen because we all recognize that when we trip over a carpet, we didn't choose to do that. Okay, that was a causally determined behavior. We can all accept that. But we like to think that some of our behaviors are freely chosen. The hard determinist thinks we're wrong because all our behaviors are causally determined and that's inconsistent with being free. So none of our behaviors are free. The compatibilist, compatibilist or soft determinist believes that some of our behaviors are freely chosen, but that all our behaviors are causally determined. And the libertarian believes that some of our behaviors really are freely chosen, that, that not everything is causally determined. So here are the options and have a, have a quick look at that and see where they all fit. OK, I did just say all that a minute ago. So where do you stand on this? So let's, let's discuss this for a few minutes, because this is a big question, isn't it? 
OK, so who's, who's a hard determinist? Come on, who's the hard-nosed ones amongst us? Could you remind us what a hard determinist is? Yes, a hard determinist is one who believes that all our behaviours are causally determined and that that means that none of our behaviours are free. OK, Do, who, who's a hard determinist? Anyone? No? OK, or, or at least nobody's prepared to admit to being a hard determinist. We might come back to that in a minute. OK, who's a libertarian? Somebody who believes that it's not the case that all our behaviours are causally determined, so some of them are free. OK, quite a few libertarians. Oh, quite a few libertarians. OK, and who's a compatibilist or a soft determinist? This is someone who believes that um, all our behaviours are causally determined, but that's consistent or compatible with some of them being free. OK, right, quite a few. OK, usually there are more people who want to be a compatibilist than this. Um, it's always tempting, I think, to be a soft determinist or a compatibilist. And the reason is that that, that enables us to be scientifically respectable because we can admit that um, everything is causally determined. Actually, not, no scientist believes everything ca is causally determined these days. But so, so we've, we've got to loosen that up a bit. But, but let me leave that in there just for the sake of argument at the moment. Um, so we can, we can be scientific realists, we, we think, by being a compatibilist. And we can also maintain our belief in free will. Well, you know, what's not to like? The, these are two things we both want to do. Let's do them. And unfortunately, um, anyone who came to my critical reasoning course last year will know that wanting it to be the case that P is a lousy reason for believing that it is the case that P. OK, we might want to be um, compatibilists, but actually it's really quite difficult because the reason that libertarians and hard determinists aren't compatibilists is because they believe that actually it's logically inconsistent compatibilism. Because how can an action, a token action, one and the same action, be both causally determined and free? That's, that's the question. OK, so um, if we don't have free will, then the question of whether we're morally responsible for any of our actions becomes a very big question. I mean, lots of people, the, the question about um, the extreme violent person who's genetically determined to be extremely violent. Um, lots of people think these days that genetic determinism um, is true. Well, if it is true, then are any of us morally responsible for our behaviours? If, if, if we can't do anything other than what we actually do, then in what sense are we morally responsible for our behaviour? Surely it's just not very useful to to end up with a situation which says no one's morally responsible because society relies on on rules of some sort which we make up to to control ourselves and, and, and it sort of leads you down the, the road of saying well if no one's morally responsible we won't have any rules. Absolutely. This is, this is why I, this is why this is such a big question because we absolutely can't run as a society, can we, without at least the, the law of the land. I mean, if there are no moral facts, which is one of the things we considered last week, there are, we know there to be legal facts, and we absolutely need these laws, and therefore we need some concept of legal responsibility. And I suggest we need some concept of moral responsibility too. But the question becomes, if this is true, is what is that concept? How are to we motivate the concept of legal and moral responsibility if we accept determinism? Um, so that's the question. Okay, just, one, just one more question yeah. and then I'll move no, on. I was just thought it was interesting you saying that no scientists believe that yes, everything is causally yeah. determined. Because I would have said in a way mm. I was a hard whatever it's called. Determinist. Yeah, determinist, but it's not useful to be one. Because, I mean, scientifically, I don't know, but I would have thought scientifically that was more likely. To be. Well, the reason, I mean, people think there are not deterministic laws. One, one reason would be quantum mechanics, which suggests well, that oh, yes, um, so there are things that are undetermined. But, of course, actually, you wouldn't want to motivate free will by the idea of things happening at random either, would you? Because our intentional behaviour doesn't appear to be um, something that's undetermined. I mean... 
we do when we act we choose to act for reasons they, they do our reasons seem to cause us to act so there are causes for our actions but they don't appear to be deterministic causes in the way that um, physical causes seem to be at least more to the deterministic end of the spectrum. Could they not be like genetics, where there is randomness and basically the stuff well, that works tend to float to the top? Uh, as I said, I'm, I was only going to take that one question. I think we'll have to leave that on one side. There might be some room left at the end for questions. We'll have to come back and look at this. But you can see, can't you, what a huge question this is. Um, free will is absolutely central to our notion of morality, to our notion of, of moral responsibility and indeed legal responsibility. And if it's correct that we don't have free will, somehow we've got to motivate the idea of moral responsibility, but without free will. And, and that's quite a big question. And obviously, there's a whole industry of people doing this. I mean, this keeps philosophers in jobs for life. So this is, we like big questions. <laughs> OK, let's, let's move on. Um, so that was the first condition for being morally responsible, that we act freely, that we choose our actions. I mean, one of the reasons we don't think of um, dogs and cats, for example, as, as morally responsible is we don't think of them as choosing their actions. They, they, they seem to be causally determined, let's say. But the other one is the idea that we're only morally and legally responsible if we can distinguish between right and wrong. So if you think back to your um, Genesis, where Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, okay, and then they became like gods, understanding good and evil. Until that point, they, they couldn't do anything wrong or right, could they? because they didn't have any concept of the distinction between right and wrong. Um, and actually, this is where Genesis is interestingly contradictory here, isn't it? Can anyone see the contradiction immediately? Because, of course, there was a wrong action, wasn't there? It was the, the very eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, OK, but, but if, you, if you think of that sort of thing, what, until you, can, uh, you do something knowing that you're doing the wrong thing, the thought goes, you're not morally responsible for it, which is why young children are not morally responsible for their actions, very young ones. As they grow up, they become morally responsible because they start to learn the difference between right and wrong. OK, so we're morally culpable for an action only if we choose to perform it knowing that we're doing something wrong. OK, so we do wrong in knowingly. Actually, Socrates um, claimed that we never do wrong knowingly because if, if we do something that's against a rule, we do it because at the moment we don't believe in that rule. So um, and let's put this in a non-moral context for a moment. I don't want to eat cream cakes because I'm getting fat and therefore I, you know, I want to lose weight, so I don't want to eat cream cakes. So how come I'm eating this cream cake right now? Um, answer, I, at the moment that I reached for the cream cake, I didn't want to be on the diet. I wanted the cream cake more than I wanted to be slim. So I never, no, I never act against my, best, my beliefs about what the best action is. And in the same way, when you do something, you don't do it believing it to be wrong. At the moment you do it, says Socrates, you believe it to be right. We never act knowingly to do the wrong thing. But, but let's put Socrates on one side. Usually, we think we need to know that an action is wrong in order to be morally responsible. So we don't start life as moral agents um, because we don't start life with the ability to di distinguish right and wrong. Um, in order to become morally responsible, we've got, actually got to acquire an understanding of when an action is right and when an action is wrong. And that's why children... Um, are not usually deemed responsible under the law until, in this country, it's 12. Uh, sorry, it used to be 12. It's now 10, I think. Do you remember when the, um, those two young boys recently, I've forgotten their names, but... Well, Thompson and Venables, yes, but just recently there was a, another case, wasn't there, when, again, the boys were 10, and there was a big thing about whether they, they could be tried at all for this act because were they of an age of legal responsibility or not, they were right on the, on the borderline of it. Uh, and that's what's going on there. OK, you might think that this is a requirement too far. Can we really claim to have 
moral knowledge at all. OK, do you remember last week we were thinking about whether or not there are moral facts? And of course, the question of whether we can know that there are moral facts is a completely different question. There might be moral facts, but we can't know what there are, or there might not be moral facts at all. OK, so um, this is a difference between metaphysics and epistemology. And anyone who's done philosophy before will, I'm sure, have come across this distinction. It's a very important distinction. When you're talking about um, metaphysics, I think I might have done this. Um, Yes, OK. Moral epistemology is concerned with how we justify beliefs about right and wrong and whether they count as knowledge. So what can we know about right and wrong? How can we justify claims to this knowledge? And so on. And moral metaphysics is concerned with the nature of moral values and whether they exist at all. So to again, to take it out of a moral context, um, there's the world that we picture OK, and there's our pictures of that world. Are you with me? So there's the chair about which I have a belief. And here, I don't think it's in my head, actually, but let's, let's say it is. Here is the belief about that chair. So we've got to distinguish between those two things. And um, putting it in that sort of way, the world that we picture is metaphysics. And our picture of the world is uh, epistemology, our beliefs, our knowledge of that world. It doesn't quite work that way because, of course, there's the metaphysics of knowledge when we're asking about the nature of beliefs and whether beliefs exist. Do you see what I mean? Then we're doing metaphysics of beliefs. So it's not the case that if it's, if it's immediately to do with belief, it's to do with epistemology because we might be doing the metaphysics of epistemology, if you like, just to confuse everything. OK, here's a little quiz for you. OK, I'm going to let you have a minute or two to sort those. Don't yell out, just do it in your head, and then we'll do them together. OK, I think that's enough time. OK, which is an epistemological question and which is a metaphysical one? How do we know that whether an action is right or wrong? Epistemology or metaphysics? Well done. It's epistemology. That's right. What justifies us in believing that lying is wrong? Hand up if you think it's epistemology. OK, hand up if you think it's metaphysics. Oh, dear. <laughs> Justification? Yeah. What's that? I'm looking at number two. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Uh, epistemology. It is epistemology. Yeah, that's right. So just look back at the definitions very quickly. Um, epistemology is concerned with how we justify beliefs and, and whether they count as knowledge, whether our beliefs count as knowledge. OK, what about number three? Are moral judgments right or wrong? Actually, true or false, I should have put there. OK, metaphysics, hands up. OK, epistemology. Oops, it's the metaphysics ones, have it on that one. That's metaphysics. Can we ever be certain about the truth of a moral claim? Epistemology? OK, metaphysics? OK, it's epistemology, that one. <laughs> OK, if moral values really exist, what is their nature? Metaphysics? Or metaphysics, good. OK, I think you all got that one. Uh, how can we be sure? that it is always and everywhere wrong to kill. How can we be sure? Is that epistemology or metaphysics? Epistemology, hands up. Good, well done. And do moral values really exist? Metaphysics, good, well done. OK, like last week, as we got to the end of it, you were beginning to get it right, um, even if you started off getting it a bit wrong. Don't worry about it, because it's going to come up throughout the lectures. And every time it does, I'll point to the fact that this is either metaphysics or epistemology. And if, if one of us gets confused, including me, I'll then try and sort out the confusion. But, but you need to be aware of that distinction. So then would you explain to number four again? Can we ever be certain yeah. about the truth of a moral claim? That one's epistemology, and the, what gives it away is the word certain. 
because certainty is to do with knowledge um, rather than to do with truth. I mean, we've got to be a bit careful there because, of course, knowledge involves truth, but knowledge goes further than truth, doesn't it? There's got to be something else there. One more question, then we're moving on. No one's doing science. Um, epistemology is very important and can be conversed about. One's usually... When one gets on to metaphysical questions, one's usually shooed into a corner, so don't go there, it's too hard. Um, is this the same thing that happened in ethics? Uh, no, because meta both metaphysics and epistemology are difficult. And if we were going to shy away from difficult questions, we could all pack up and go home now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm shocked to hear the scientists. Oh, but, yeah, but, uh, but why go with metaphysics? Well, they're not trained they in metaphysics. Yes, 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 quite. Actually, I'm just writing a lecture at the moment on, on metaphysics for scientists, which I'm having the most terrible trouble writing because... Um, well, never mind, you don't need to know that, but I am having the most terrible trouble writing it. It's very interesting. Um, OK, so think back to last week and our discuss discussion of particularism and generalism. To which one, do you think, does the idea of moral knowledge come more easily? It, it's a difficult question, this one, and, and if you have trouble with it, that's perfectly reasonable. Generalism. Generalism. I, th I think you're right. Why? Knowledge implies knowledge of something that exists, and if you're a particularist, then you're saying that the, you don't have these rules, absolute moral facts. You, you, you can't. Oh, no, know. you could still have moral facts, but then they're going to be token facts, not yeah. not um, not rules. But I think you're right to mention rules. The fact is, actually, if there are moral rules, and if they're lower order rules like don't lie, keep promises, etc., moral knowledge comes very easily, doesn't it? All you have to do is see that an action has a certain property, the property of being a lie or the property of keeping a promise or something like that, and you see at the same time that it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. So moral knowledge comes very easily if you subscribe to lower order absolutism. But actually it doesn't quite work like that because um, we don't always know what falls under a rule. I mean, for example, we looked at the dilemma. We could see which rules applied there, be kind and be honest, but we couldn't see which one we ought to act on, could we? Not at all obvious which one we ought to act on, so they come into conflict. And if we consider the higher order rules, produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number, well, do you remember, uh, did I mention Hiroshima? I'm not sure, but um, dropping the bomb on Hiroshima there is a fact of the matter of whether that led to the greatest happiness or didn't lead to the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Um, there can be a lot of disagreement about which was the fact in that case, wasn't it? So actually, having rules doesn't always lead to, to a, an easier form of moral knowledge. And of course, with um, the other thing um, is that particularists might not know in advance whether an action is going to be right or wrong because they need to know the whole situation, for example. Um, but given a token action, we sometimes, actually we often feel certain we know what's right or wrong. So when I, the reason I use the example of the Nazis and the Jews is because I am absolutely sure that everybody in this room is going to have the strong intuition that in that situation, the right thing to do is to tell a lie. Okay, and, and there are loads of examples that I'm going to bring up because I know exactly which intuitions they're going to stimulate from you. Because once I give you the situation, and, and let's think about um, your friend again who comes home and says, what do you think of my hair? And you think, yuck. Um, okay, what if this is the first time you've seen me smile for six months? Okay, I've been really miserable for six months. This is the first time you've seen me smile. Are you going to be honest? about not liking my hair, or is that going to tip you towards being kind? So do you see, by, by filling in just a little more of the background, a little more of the situation, I can shift your intuitions this way and that way, because actually you have very strong particularist intuitions about what's right and what's wrong. So, so actually, moral knowledge is a, is a big thing. Do we have it at all? And if we do have it, what is it? 
Is it a matter of applying a rule? And if so, is it lower order rules or higher order rules? And if it isn't a matter of applying a rule, is it a matter of a sort of moral sense, a moral intuition that we just somehow know just in the same way we can see blue, can we see that an action is right or wrong, although seeing wouldn't be a sense perception in this case? Do you see what I mean? The question of moral knowledge is another very big one. Here are some different justifications we might have. We might say, as I've just suggested, that we have a moral sense. So Kant believed that, that we could see right and wrong for example, we might say that we know inductively which behaviours are likely to be, or you could put a bracket around those, right and wrong. So the uh, utilitarianisms, utilitarians are inductivists. They believe that, that it's by seeing that an action doesn't produce the happiness over time that you form the rule that this um, action is wrong, this type of action is wrong. Um, or you might say, and we're going to look at this in a bit more depth in a minute, that we have a tacit agreement. In other words, we know because we know um, from the agreements we have which actions are right or wrong. So you'd be tending towards a cultural uh, account of morality there. Um, but the questions of whether we have moral knowledge and how we have moral knowledge are two huge questions that I'm going to leave you to ponder. So, so that's three questions you've got at the moment. You've got, do we have free will? Um, or you can include in that, uh, is determinism true in any form? And now these two. Um, I'm going to leave you with those. And remember that we're going to be coming back to these questions throughout the, the four weeks that we're looking at the different moral theories. So this is not your last chance to think about this. This is just introducing you to the background. <coughs> okay, the moral law and the law of the land differ when it comes to knowledge. Okay, big question about possession of moral knowledge, but the law of the land necessarily is made explicit. You, you cannot have, uh, well, in fact, there's something very badly wrong. P there are places where the laws are, are not written down. You can fall foul of the law without realising you are, but we, we tend to think of those societies as there's something wrong with them because we believe that the law of the land should be made public and that ignorance of it isn't a defense because it's made public in such a way that that you can't really defend yourself by saying that you didn't know such and such was a law I thought about I didn't know I couldn't park here Just, gov okay so that the moral law differs from the law of the land is absolutely clear I hope um, can you think of an action that's immoral but not illegal? What? Hundreds. Hundreds. <laughs> Would you like to give me one? <laughs> um, infidelity. Yeah. Infidelity. Yes, absolutely. That, that's maybe immoral, but it's certainly not illegal. Um, okay, telling your mum she looks great when you, when you don't think she does, that's not illegal, but arguably it's immoral. Um, Etc. There are lots of actions that are immoral but not illegal. What about an action that's illegal but not immoral? This is a slightly more difficult because the very fact that it's illegal might make you think that doing it makes it immoral. But if we put that complication on one side for a minute, can you think of an action that's illegal but not immoral? Cert certain medical interventions near death. Um, oh, that's interesting. OK. Um, Helping someone to die, assisting someone oh, to yes. commit suicide, yes, that's, that, that's certainly illegal in this yes, country, no. but is it immoral? No, Very big it's question. It's not illegal everywhere, is it? No, but, but it is in this country. Okay, did you have one? Like I said, parking on a double yellow line. Uh, parking on a double yellow line. There's nothing intrinsically immoral about that, is there? I'm sure. Oh, is there? No. Oh. <laughs> the, if there is anything immoral about it, it's only that it's against the law, I assume. Unless it's outside your house, in which case it would be very annoying. Uh, it, could, it could be very annoying, okay. In theory, it could presumably cause an accident. Yes, yes, uh, it's certainly parking dangerously is probably immoral. Okay, 
Um, we sometimes think laws are unjust, but how can a law be unjust? How can it be that, that a law ought to be made or that a law ought to be scrapped if there isn't some idea of ought that's over and above the idea of the law of the land itself? Do you see what I mean? If, the law, if there's nothing more than the law of the land, then no law of the land could be unjust, could it? You, you must be using an idea of unjust here or not fair or something like that, that, that's something in addition to the law of the land. So the moral law, and, and in using the moral law here, I'm not necessarily talking about rules. I'm talking about the way it has, seems to have authority over us. When we see that something's right, we, we see that we ought to do it. Um, the moral law and the law of the land are two quite different things. And if they're quite different things, it becomes very interesting to ask, well, what's the relation between them? How, how is the moral law related to the law of the land and vice versa? OK, John Locke. I think you've probably all heard of John Locke, famous English philosopher. Um, he actually had a hand in writing the American Constitution. So um, if, if I were teaching loads of Americans here, they would be very interested to hear that on his book, Two Treaties of Government, their constitution rests. OK, he believed that the law of the land must be firmly based on the moral law, um, that if it wasn't, there was something wrong. OK, this, his argument for that is that he believed in the state of nature. OK, and the state of nature is the state we were in before we became a nation state or a society. So um, presumably there was a time um, when we all just lived as sort of loose tribes or loose families or that sort of thing. There, there was no law. There was no um, state that could call us to order. Um, and a lot of philosophers often appeal to the state of nature in thinking about moral and political philosophy because, of course, you want to know what came along with the state and what was already there before. And Locke believed that in the state of nature, um, so before there were any laws of the land, um, the moral law already existed. He called it the law of nature, um, but actually by the law of nature, he meant God's law. Um, so, and, and he claimed it as preserve as much as possible. So even in the state of nature, we were required to preserve as much as possible. So to go um, wantonly chopping down trees wouldn't have been, would have been a violation of God's law, of the law of nature. Um, to go chopping down people would be even more of a violation of God's law. He believed that the idea of a law without a sanction is incoherent. If, if you've got a law, there's got to be some sort of downside of breaking it. Otherwise, what, what makes it a law at all? Um, so he also believed that in the state of nature, each of us held the executive power of the law of nature, the right to punish violations of it. So if I'm in my cave and Erica is beside me and I'm looking after her and, and you come along and beat her up, <laughs> you know, I, I've got the right to beat you up in return. <laughs> Um, because if she's my property yes. or, or if she's a dependent on me and you violate that, then, then I have the executive power of the law of nature and I have the right to self-defense and to defend my property. And OK, I want you to think about this. Let, let's imagine now that we're in the state of nature and this is what the situation is. So there is a law of nature. There is a moral law that says that we, we can't go around um, destroying things. Um, and we each have the executive power of the law of nature. We, we can also all wield this sanction if we see a violation of the law of nature. OK, do you like this or not? No. no. You, you don't like it? OK, sorry, what did you say? Is it not contrary to... to if, it, if Locke was referring back to God's law, is there sort of a tit-for-tat thing not contrary to God's law? No, because if you violate God's law... If anyone is, is entitled... So if I come and attack you, that's a violation of God's law. You have the right to defend yourself against what me. What turning the other cheek? 
Um, we're not talking about the Christian God here necessarily. Right. Um, may, maybe we are, but, but um, if you perceive my attacking you as a violation of the law of nature, you have the right to defend yourself according to Locke. Locke, yeah, it? yeah. Well, it's it's Locke we're discussing here. Yes. But I mean, there are different people have different views about the state of nature. Yeah. yeah um, I just think the sort of you know hitting someone back is not. Well, acceptable. but I think you're, we're actually talking about what you're asking about here because what I want to ask now is what 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 do you think of this? You don't like it. Lots of people said, why not? It's got to be it's yeah. In what way? Um, the, the hitting back has got to be constant. Uh, in other words, if I just tap her on the shoulder and, and she, she annihilates me, uh, that, that's wrong. OK, good. Yes, I think that's probably right. Any other reasons for thinking it's wrong? Chop, chopping down trees to create fields to grow food might be a reason for chopping down the trees. Some people might be against chopping down the trees because they need the trees. They, they want the berries from the trees or or whatever. So there's, there are, you know, conflicts in... OK, so there's no way to police conflicts um, or different beliefs about what the law of nature states. OK, mm. did you have your hand up? There's got to be some inconsistency, presumably, in how these things are. If we all have executive power, mine might not be the same as yours. My mm. decision to react might not be the same as yours. Good, yeah, that, that would be another thing. So, so if somebody goes and beats up um, this lady here, whose name I've forgotten... Margaret, um, and somebody goes and beats up, where's, where's this nice strong man here? John will, John will do. <laughs> okay, somebody goes and beats up John. Um, there might, there's going to be a different response, isn't there? Because it, perhaps John is better able to defend himself than Margaret is. I don't know, you may be a jiu-jitsu champion for all I know. Um, but yeah, okay, so there are lots of drawbacks. Sorry, there's one more here. I was going to say, wouldn't this tend towards anarchy? Um, well, if anarchy is the definition of, of without law, then yes, indeed, it is anarchy. Um, but of course, there's nothing wrong with that because we tend to think of anarchy as wrong because it means the, the dissolution of the rule of law. But here, there is no rule of law. All there is is the law of nature or God's law. So there is no state to impose um, the rule of law. Um, OK, Locke believed that there would be serious inconveniences, he called them rather sweetly, um, in the state of nature. Uh, and you've, you've got them, actually, all of them. There's no impartial judgment. So if I'm very hot-tempered and somebody comes and, and taps me on the knee and I... Oh, actually, it was you who was hot-tempered, wasn't it? I tap you on the knee and, and you annihilate me. OK, there's no impartial judgment. Um, there's also no standard punishment, as you said, that punishment isn't necessarily consonant with the crime. Um, and also force wouldn't necessarily be on the side of the right. If, if I can defend myself very well, but I tend to be hot tempered, um, a violation of my property uh, rights, for example, might be punished very differently from a, um, a violation of somebody else's property rights. So all sorts of major inconveniences here. And Locke proposed to solve this in this way. He thinks it would be rational for us. And actually, it would, wouldn't it? I mean, if we were in that situation and we started to get worried about this, we probably would all want to come together and, and form a few agreements about what the law should be interpreted as and how it would be punished and who would punish it and so on. And this is exactly what Locke thought. He thought that we would transfer our individual executive power into the hands of the community and then accept majority opinion on who should wield this power. So we all come together and we say, OK, I, I won't take the law into my own hands, as we think of it. Um, the, the law will be in the hands of the law, the executive. Um, but we would have to then elect an executive, wouldn't we? We'd have to elect a government to wield the executive power of the law of nature. So we, this is a two-step process for, for Locke. Firstly, we contract with each other um, to accept majority rule and to relinquish our individual executive power so we no longer um, punish violations of the law of nature ourselves. And secondly, we consent to the executive as decided by the majority. So we get together, we say, OK, we're not going to take the law into our own hands, but who's going to look after it? Who's going to be responsible for it? And we elect those five there 
to, to wield our executive power. And so next time you come and beat me up, instead of beating you up back or getting John to do it for me, I, I go to this slot and I say, Oi, look, <laughs> look, what, look what she's just done to me. Will you punish this? And you've got your book of rules and you go down and you say, OK, that, that sort of violation, this sort of punishment. And you can see how our rule of law would be generated by that sort of process. And ingeniously, um, the two-step process generates the conditions of justified rebellion. And this mattered to Locke a great deal. Locke went to Westminster School, uh, and he was there, aged 14, um, when the only act of regicide in this country was committed. Uh, within his hearing, um, he certainly would have heard the baying of the crowds and so on, um, when Charles I, it was the first, wasn't it? Um, well, I have to get that right. Um, was executed. Um, and the question of when it was right to rebel against a government, um, a properly elected government, or in this case, a king with a divine right, um, was a big question for him. Um, so this two-step process does that um, because he thinks that when the government fails to execute the law of nature, when, for example, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name too. When Helen beats me up um, and I go and complain to you and you say, oh, we like Helen, <laughs> we don't like you, <laughs> um, therefore we're not going to do anything about it, um, you're failing to execute the law of nature. And I'm going to start thinking, oh, hang on, <laughs> you know, why, why did I give up my executive power for that lot to, to do it? They're, they're not doing their job. Um, and that's the sort of thing that makes you want to take the law into your own hands, doesn't it? It's exactly the sort of thing that leads to the setting up of um, vigilantes, etc. Um, or when the government goes further than the law of nature permits and says, OK, let's say they get a bit big for their boots. They look as if they're going to get a bit big for their boots, don't they? And, and they start telling us what to do here and what to do here and what time to go to bed and they start... Um, they become a nanny state, perhaps. Um, at that point, we might start thinking, well, hang on, I don't like this. I, I wouldn't have agreed to this if I realised that's what, I, what we were getting into. So under these two conditions, thinks Locke, um, you're actually going to back off and, and you're going to, the, the government is going to lose your consent. So the government loses the attitudinal consent of the people. And according to Locke, I've seen your question, I'll come back in a minute, it should now resign. OK, so when, yes, cynical laughter, is it? OK, it should now resign. And if it doesn't, rebellion is justified. OK, so actually, this is happening right now, isn't it, in a very big and very interesting way in Egypt, uh, and indeed it happened in Tunisia rather more smoothly. Um, but that's exactly what's happening. The Egyptian government has lost the attitudinal consent of the body politic. Um, it should resign. It's not going to. And things are actually really getting very uncomfortable, aren't they? Very, very... Because um, rebellion... Lots of people do think rebellion is justified. I mean, one of the difficulties, actually, of Locke's theory is he thinks that it's only when the majority lose the attitudinal consent that, that there's the right to rebel. And, of course, the question of when the majority does becomes an empirical question. Have we got sort of question numbers, isn't it? So, but it's a very ingenious theory. You've both got... Um, Oh, sorry, I just need to say this. We never return to the state of nature. We only ever return to the, to the body politic. It never becomes the case that you take the executive power of the law of nature back into your own hands. It's never the case that the individual has, again, the right to wield the executive power. We return only to this body politic where we've got the agreement that we'll, we're a community, and then we need to decide on a new government. OK? Question. Locke's arguments can surely only ever be true for a democracy. Um, if there is a dictatorship or, or some other different form of government, then I can't see how Locke's argument can possibly hold. Well, 
you, uh, Locke um, relies on but never justifies his belief that it's going to be mas majority decision making. What, what we could do, of course, having given up our executive power, we could all decide to elect you as a dictator, uh, you and your, your um, progeny, yes. For, for ad infinitum, you know, it would just be always you and your progeny. Um, we could do that, couldn't we? I, I think Locke thinks that that would be such an obviously stupid move that <laughs> that he didn't even consider it. I'm sorry, not <laughs> that wasn't an insult. <laughs> I'm sure you and your progeny are very nice. <laughs> Um, but the idea of giving up our executive power so it would go into the hands of one person and his, his um, well, I mean, it was Egypt children. That triggered me to think about this because I would perhaps argue that Egypt is not a democracy in the way that we might see it as such. Well, no, it's not. Um, and, and the question is, if, is that what they're trying to get? But you're, you're absolutely right that Locke just assumes that, that we'd go for majority rule. Locke has given the conditions under which we would move on. He, he's explained why we would move from the state of nature. He's assumed that we'd accept majority rule. But what the important thing I wanted to get across is the idea that this is a two-step process uh, and that the two steps allow for a theory of justified rebellion. So what Locke has done in, ingeniously, and, and I do recommend reading two treaties of government because it's very easy to read and very interesting. He, he shows us, gives us an account of political obligation of why we should obey the law and an account of when we shouldn't obey the law, of, of when we're justified in rebelling against the law. So according to Locke, our obligation to obey the law rests on the notion of consent, um, together with our pre-existing obligation to obey the moral law, which is an obligation to God. Um, and you might think this is actually rather a shaky resting place. Um, the idea of consent is, is a very difficult one. Um, did, you, did any of you consent to obey the law? No. Are, are any of you naturalized citizens? No, okay, so there's nobody in this. Are any of you American? <laughs> no, okay, so there's nobody in this room who has consented to obey the law. In America, in schools, they do consent to obey the law um, every day. They, they wow. swear allegiance to the, to the flag every How morning. Uh, yes, that's a very good question. They're, they're very young when they do it, so of course you've then got another question. They do consent, but is it real consent? If you ask them to consent at that sort of age, and of course under those conditions where everyone's expected to do it and et cetera, et cetera, are they really consenting? I think most of us would probably say no. Um, if, if one of our ancestors coming out of the state of nature consented, well, why does that bind us? I mean, I don't take myself to be bound by something that my great, 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 great grandfather said. Um, we might say, well, it's tacit consent of some kind. I mean, if, if we all went to the pub afterwards, and that's rather a lot of us, isn't it? I'll take the executive to the pub. Come on, you five. We'll go down to the pub. They all buy me a drink, and I say, thanks, everyone. I'm off now. Um, they might think, hmm, uh, yes, hang on. She got five drinks there and then disappeared before buying hers. By agreeing to, to a round system, you tacitly consent, don't you, to buying your own round. I mean, there are people who, who escape this. I mean, there, there was a time when women weren't expected to, to play this game. And certainly if somebody is very young, uh, if you've got a 16-year-old with you, on the whole, you don't expect them to to join in. So there are exceptions to this, but on the whole, you tacitly consent to something um, when you know that you're taking on an obligation by your actions. Well, we've all, if we've all been educated in England, um, England has paid for, or Britain, I should say, Britain has paid for our education. Even if we went to independent school, there was still an amount of money that was sitting there waiting for us. Um, and we use the National Health Service probably if we've ever been taken to hospital by ambulance or something like that. Does our gratitude to the state confer on us an obligation to obey the law? Do we somehow consent to the law, at least tacitly, um, by staying in the country and, and using its services? Yes. 
No, why not? Who said um, that? Um, you said that. Yeah, no, it, it doesn't feel right for the first. Uh, oh, that's not a good argument, it's true. Um, Nothing wrong with intuitions. The, no. You don't want them to be at the end of argument, but, but you need them to start it. Mm -hmm. No, we're well, okay on that then. Okay, you don't. It's certainly true, isn't it? If somebody came and gave me a, um, a birthday present that I hadn't looked for, I would be obliged to say thank you, but it's not obvious I'd be obliged to do anything else. Could you say that the people of Egypt have given their tacit consent up until now by living quietly for the last 30 years? Well, that would be this sort of argument, yes. What do we think about this? Have they? Would you say the international community also give its tacit consent to what? To, to um, the Egyptian government. Yes, absolutely. That's right. By, in, by interacting with the Egyptian government, the international community has given its tacit consent, perhaps. But you, you might ask again, well, actually, why were they living quietly? Because anyone who was noisy was... Cut. Well, I, I actually don't know anything about the Egyptian society, so I'm just assuming this. But um, I assume that I would live quietly if the alternative was being carted off to prison and beaten on the soles of my feet or something like that. I would live very quietly. <laughs> I, I was just by voting, we're tacitly consenting. Yes, that's a good one, isn't it? By voting, are, are we not? We're, we're actually actively engaging in the situation. But actually, here's an interesting question. If I voted Labour in the last government, and I did say if I voted Labour, I'm not telling you what I voted. Um, if I voted Labour in the last government, am I required to obey the laws of this government? Yes, you've given your tacit consent to the... Democratic you think so, do you? OK, a lot of people would say that by... But does that mean that um, if I didn't vote at all in the last election, that I'm thereby free to, to disobey the law? You had the ability because I, I didn't tacitly consent. You had the ability to vote, you opted not to vote. Yes. Um, but I opted not to vote because I didn't want to obey the law. No, I mean, is there, is there any way that I could opt out of the obligation to obey the law? It looks as if there isn't, actually, isn't there? I, if, even if I moved, I'd be in, under some law somewhere, wouldn't I? So, so actually, the fact I can't do anything to opt out suggests that maybe I'm not um, bound by the fact that I stay. What else can I do? Anyway, we don't need to go into this anymore, but what I'm doing is, is sh sh this consent theory is really a very shaky um, foundation for the idea of the obligation to obey the law. Um, and of course, there's also this pre-existing moral obligation. And Locke believes that in the state of nature, we're already bound to obey God's law, the law of nature, the moral law. Well, where does that come from, actually? I mean, is there, you know, is there just a natural obligation to obey the moral law, to do the right thing? Maybe there is, but it, it's not obvious that this is a brute fact, is it? So, OK, that's Locke's theory. So, and here's another question for you to ponder. Do you agree with Locke that the law of the land must rest on the moral law? And if so, you might like to ponder on where the moral law comes from in the first place. And he thought it came from God. If you don't accept that, you need to find, and you do accept that there was some sort of moral law, you need to find some source of that moral law. Um, in recent years, though, state of nature theory has been revolutionized by this chap here, John Rawls. And he argued that both moral and political obligation rest on a hypothetical agreement. OK, not on an actual agreement, not known by whom, etc. Um, according to Rawls, um, you're obliged to obey the laws that are imposed on you by a government and you're obliged to obey the moral laws of your society if and only if these laws are fair. Uh, that might trigger a question for you there, but let's I move really on. I think they're fair, but you don't. So. Well, let, let's move on. Um, a huge question for Rawls becomes when is the law fair, moral law or the law of land? Rawls' answer is that a law is fair if that law would have been chosen by rational, self-interested people, people like us, 
in the original position. OK, so let's have a closer look at this. There are four aspects to Rawls's uh, original position, to his theory of justice, as he calls it. You, you can read his book. It's, it's quite easy to read. It's very thick, very repetitive. Um, but, it, but it is quite easy to read. Um, OK, what's the original position? Well, it's this. In the original position are people like us, let's say. They're, they're um, rational. They're also self-interested. Um, if they have a choice, they're going to go for a choice that's going to, to pursue their own interests. They're, on the whole, I mean, they are altruistic sometimes, but, but not always. And also, you've got to ask themselves why they're altruistic when they're altruistic. The fact is they, they are interested in their own well-being and they're rational. Um, they're also behind the veil of perception. The only thing they know, the only account of good they have, is the thin theory of good. OK, behind the veil of perception, they don't know who they are, what they are. So they don't know whether they're male or female. They don't know whether they're old or young. They don't know whether they're intelligent or thick. Um, they don't know whether they're rich or poor. They don't know whether they're ill or healthy. Um, OK, so they know nothing about themselves. So they've got the thin theory of good. OK, now the thin theory of good tells them what's good for human beings in general. Actually, we're assuming they're human beings. They might be Martians. There's no reason why they shouldn't be Martians as long as they're rational, self-interested, etc., etc. Um, but they've, the thin theory of good tells them things like um, it's women who have babies, not men. Um, it tells them things like um, human beings need a reasonable amount of warmth, so many calories a day, um, this, that and the other. So they've got a, a very basic theory of psychology, very basic theory of politics, very basic theory of physiology. They know what human beings need to flourish. OK, so they don't know what they need to flourish, um, but they do know what human beings need to flourish. Um, and it's in this position, the original position, that we decide on the laws of justice. Okay? We decide on what grounds society should be run. So can anyone tell me why this is an interesting thought experiment? What, why does Rawls set it up in this, this really rather complicated way? Why does he put people behind the veil of perception? Why does he give them the thin theory of good? And why is it that people who make choices about how society should be run from this position are such that their choices are deemed the right ones? Can anyone answer me that? Does he want them to be dispassionate? Uh, can you cash that out a bit? He, he doesn't want favouritism. Uh, good, yes, absolutely. C would anyone like to expand on that a bit? What, what does... Removing as much subjectivity as possible, as objective as possible. Um, OK. Uh, I, I usually ban people from using the words objective and subjective till they've done philosophy for at least 10 years. But, but, <laughs> but yes, what he wants people to do is, is to not m choose the position of... Uh, sorry, the rules of justice for themselves, doesn't he? So he doesn't want them to apply self-interest. If I know... Isn't it more than um, that, Isn't it more than that? In it may be more than that as well, but it is that. He's, he's actually also supporting a, a, an enlightenment discourse, which is in favour of certain people. It cuts out the emotional side, and women are downgraded, and you know all sorts of things. Well, but, but the, the point of doing that is so that the rules of justice are chosen from an objective point of view. They're, they're not chosen from uh, the point of view of... So, for example, if I don't know I'm fe whether I'm male or female, I'm not going to say there should be a curfew on women. Um, I can't see that there should be a curfew on women. On the other hand, my thin theory of good tells me nothing about men and women that makes me think that if I were a woman, I'd be happy for there to be a, a curfew. We're getting into much more detail now than, than roles than you need to. Um, but can you see that if I don't know whether I'm a man or a woman, I'm not going to choose any laws that are going to do women down or that are going to do men down because I might turn out to be the wrong one. 
if you see what I mean. Um, if I don't know whether I'm rich or poor, um, am I going to bet on being rich? Be a bit of a silly thing to do, wouldn't it? Um, I need to think, well, hang on, what if I'm poor? Um, so I want to arrange the laws of society in such a way that I don't come off very badly if I am poor. Um, so I want to do the best. I want to do the best for myself, whatever situation I'm in. And doing the best for myself, whatever situation I'm in, means actually doing the best for everyone, doesn't it? If you're behind the veil of perception, if all you've got is the thin theory of good. Does that satisfy? No, what you? I think it's, it's too rational. Ah, oh, no, well, he, he does. I, I'm, well, actually, one of the big questions you've got to ask, I mean, there are all sorts of questions to ask rules about this. One is the rationality. The other is self-interest. Um, I mean, actually, people have a, a huge tendency to be altruistic. Why, why is self-interest important? I think, I think both those questions can be answered, actually. But another big question would be, well, what do we put behind the veil of perception and what do we put in the thin theory of good? So, for example, um, in apartheid South Africa, um, if you had suggested that the idea that blacks are stupid should go behind the veil of perception, they'd say, well, why? I mean, this is just a fact, isn't it? And you'd think, well, hang on, <laughs> no, not according to us, it's not a fact. Um, so, so actually, uh, how you decide what goes behind the veil of perception and what comes into the thin theory of good uh, suggests that you're going to get out what you put in. But that's actually not the point, because we, we don't have to actually put anything in just here. We just, we're just looking at the decision procedure. This is actually really a rather, if you don't know the, whether you're an alcoholic in Bond Square or whether you're a, a trust fund kid um, in a large house, etc., then asking you to choose the principles of justice from behind the veil of perception um, when you've got only the thin theory of good looks like a good idea, doesn't it? Um, what Rawls would say is that um, this theory explains both moral and political obligation. Um, oh, hang on. I haven't explained why it does. OK, how does Rawls' theory explain both moral and political obligation? Answer, if you're living in a society and you see a law that you think um, you ask yourself, OK, why are you obliged to obey this law? Well, if the law is such that you can see that you would have chosen it had you been in that situation, then you are obliged to obey it. Do you see what I mean? And actually, you can put it even better than that. If, if the government that you're um, being asked to obey is a generally just government, then even if, so this, this government is such that you can see that if you had been in the, in the um, original position, you would have chosen it as being an acceptable government, then even if this particular law is unjust, maybe there's still nevertheless reason to obey it. So we go from there being an actual agreement on which we're all going to say, oh no, there wasn't, or nobody asked me, Gov, um, to a hypothetical agreement where you're asked to say, well, would you have accepted this had you been asked uh, in this original position? And if your answer to that is yes, um, OK, you may have come out unfairly. You would have said that because you might have been very poor. Uh, it's turned out that you're very rich and you wish you hadn't said that, but, um, but you can see that you would have said it and that there were good reasons for saying it. This is the source of your political obligation. And for Rawls, it's also the source of your moral obligation. So if there's a moral command in your society, um, your obligation to obey it is again, because if you look at it and you think that you would have subscribed to it, from the original position, then that's the ground of your obligation to obey it. Not any actual consent, but this hypothetical consent of, had you been in this position, you would have agreed. OK, so um, notice that there's, there's a, a pre-existing notion of fairness in here as well. 
So just as Locke already had the pre-existing idea of moral obligation, Rawls has got it in there as well. It looks as if it's actually very difficult to get away from a pre-existing notion of moral obligation.